part of the economy, then I'm criticizing. It's not all the outside of history that we are all about. Um, I think it's quite obvious to point out that money is minted and was always fabricated by kings and princes and leaders and governments and banks. So unless we are bartering, it's very difficult to escape that reality. But the extent to which we want to compromise our principles and take money, which might be dirty, and all money is dirty, um, might differ according to our values. The other uh, little image that I wanted to start with is something that uh, a few people of my generation in ITM well, may have heard. Uh, a fellow called Neil Wallace, who used to be very active in ITM, who said once, ITM is a network of professionals in the performing arts sector, and we are either resource givers, like a festival director who can give permission, or resource seekers, now that was a few years ago, and I think the situation has changed uh, to a great deal. Um, for one, uh, the, the sources of funding that we can approach now have changed a lot in, uh, in this region, in the mainland region. Cultural institutes used to be the place where we all went, whether we were European or non-European, for funding. That has significantly changed over the years. The cultural institutes have formed clusters and groups and an association called UNIC, which you probably know, which uh, goes to the same sources of funding that we, the independent sector, goes to. That's kind of a shock. We're competing for funds. Foundations, which have been a traditional source of funding for all of us, wherever we live, have started to also go to some other foundations that we would go to to raise money. So the foundations we are going to are also competing with the independent sector. Foundations have also become actors. They become initiators. They become festival creators. They become performance and co-production commissioners. So I think that the whole situation is much more fluid, and probably it will become much more fluid. And that gives me a good segue to introduce the panel, because people on here are also not one thing or the other. Um, they have been, some of them, artists or architects. Um, they have worked for organizations which have sought resources, and they have been working for organizations which give resources. So I'm very pleased um, to be able to introduce um, the Nelson Introduction, of course, who is now in a position of uh, managing clusters and clusters of projects, re-granting, but also, as we know, as one of the founders of Atichahad and, and a commissioner for Damascus um, and other projects which commission. We've been in, in both caps. We've worn at least both caps. Um, Jasper, you have been both uh, working for festival, Santos Nacidad, a very emblematic festival in this room. Uh, so you were looking for resources, now you're giving them. And you've been living in at least four countries and active in these four countries. Um, Stephen, you have been a theater playwright, festival director, the commission, you put the money, and now you're in the British Council looking after money and partnerships. Uh, Pascal Bernay, I know that you started life as an architect student, at least. Had gone through many different challenges in your life, including being very involved in the Mediterranean. Uh, setting up networks and so on, and uh, for the last 10 years, perhaps, then uh, working as the director of an interface between European sources of funding on many different levels, not only cultural and not only in Europe, giving 
that information and helping people access these funds. Amar, you are amongst us, the theoretician, the policy analyst, the person who's working for the Algerian Development Bank, African Development Bank, oh, okay. Um, and so we were going to start with you because we hope that you will give us a more theoretical background. I'll be using a very short PowerPoint presentation. I'll be speaking about my experience, not in the African Development Bank, but as a person who's lived in different countries and a person who has dealt with different donor institutions. Mary asked us to work on this title or question, and since the question is quite complicated and needs uh, many hours to answer, I decided to use a caricature, a caricature but not in the artistic meaning, but in the literature meaning, so that I facilitate my own work and the way I want to lay down my ideas. When there is an artist who asks for a donation or for a grant from a state, whether from the public or the private sector, if it's of course an authoritarian state, then his or her art will be constrained and his work should be to glorify the regime. An example about that is Algeria, but if there is an artist who lives also under an authoritarian system, but asks for international funding, so I think it's something impossible. And here I can give you also the example of Algeria. It's not authorized for the foreign entities to fund the artists who are resident in our country. Now, what about an artist who lives? in a democratic context or in a country and asks, and asks for public funding. Here, I think that there will be some kind of artistic freedom. Now, if we have an artist also in a democratic context asking for private funding, so from a private uh, entity, then we will have an art-oriented market. And now, if we have an artist living under a democratic system, that has a strong economy and asks for a grant or a donation on the international level. So here the result is the same. He or she doesn't need the funding from the international arena because the country, his country or his state is taking care of that. And my last example, and this is where I'll be focusing, if there is an artist living in a democratic context, but where the economy is weak and asks for international funding, then his art 
will be ideologically oriented or will be based on the strategy of the donating. So I'll be focusing on this example because, as I said, I'm living in the Ivory Coast and Cote d'Ivoire and I travel to Benin, for example. That is a state in the democratic state and there, since the economy is weak and also the funding from the national market is weak, so most of the artists go towards the foreign or international funding. Let me give you here an example about an artwork that was done by an artist from he asked some people from Benin to lie down inside the, culture, the French cultural center so that people can walk in on their backs and as you see most of those who go to the cultural center in Kotonou are French, are European, and if they want, they can also take their children with them so they can take their first steps on the backs of the Africans. So we see how children are trained to step on the backs of the Africans. And I was able to speak to the artist. He told me this is a performance. So I said to him, I challenge you to put five Europeans in the place of those people from Berlin. And of course, he wasn't able to do this. I gave him one year to do it, and he was able to do it. So, this is what I wanted to show you to explain that when we have democracy, when an artist needs international funding, this means that his or her art will be oriented the way the donating entity wants it. And here the donating entity is the French contractor in Cotton. So the question is, can we stop the international funding? Of course not. If there is an entity that has good intentions in supporting the artists and the democratic context that have a weak economy, then they need only to show their positive intention, their good intention, and put transparent criteria for this end, criteria that are based on competition, so that artists or citizens can have an idea about the intentions of the donor. In my conclusion, I would like to say that in the best case scenario, artists need a democratic context with a strong economy to be able to have their artistic freedom of expression without any constraints or problems. Because for me, the artist who accepts grants from foreign entities, from international companies, then they will not, or who will not respect the criteria, then it's like he got his money from an authoritarian regime that is telling him how to do his job. And I think that within both these trends, meaning when we have the authoritarian regime or the other, then if the artist doesn't want to receive this funding, we need to call this as being a resistance.
when they live under a democratic context, but they don't have national funding. So if they refuse such funding, like what we saw in Benin, then this is called dignity or karama in Arabic. Thank you very much. And we always have to mediate that agenda 
um, there's always a power relationship that we just cannot avoid. Um, and that's, I think, the starting point that we must, we must, we must take. Um, the, to give a few examples, um, one which is in the article is about this, this um, projects. Now, already more than 10 years ago, from the Flemish government in South Africa, where the, the idea of the Flemish government was we do it correctly if we let the government in South Africa decide on where our funding goes to. Um, because that's our eye to eye partner, and that's when we are uh, doing things in a non colonial way, that's the most correct way. Of course, the, the uh, Department of Arts and Culture in South Africa is notorious for its uh, lack of capacity, unfortunately. Um, it's a department that has 600 people uh, working for it, um, and very, very few of those are selected in their positions because of any kind of people we have in the arts sector. Um, and the result of that was obviously also very problematic. On the other hand, you have the, the Swedish corporation um, that, for the case of Zimbabwe, decided to give a, a complete grant, so basically the, the whole fund that they were supporting in arts and culture in, in Zimbabwe um, to an organization which they created, so the Zimbabwe uh, Arts and Culture Trust Fund, which is completely run by Zimbabweans, which has a board of Zimbabweans, undoubtedly the board of which is on that board and I stand to be corrected. Um, and that's of course a very different uh, model. Because of the choice of these people, and very often it's about the choice of the right individuals in the right uh, context in which to do that at that time, um, this was an extremely effective tool to support arts and culture in, in Zimbabwe. In both cases, the, the decision is really the initial decision of, 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 the, of the funder. And in that sense, the, the, the power position of that fund is done that just it's a complete illusion to say that we should work on a sort of partnership basis or that you know, we should um, rescind this, this position that we can't work in a colonial way. It, it is, I think, a colonial uh, remnant, it is a colonial practice. Um, and it's also, I think, at this, at this point we should use words maybe where, where they're in a, in, a, in a slightly provocative way, maybe to, to say that this is, this is the reality that we're working today. We, we're talking about post-colonialism or neo-colonialism. Maybe we should just continue to talk about colonialism for the time being. Um, and also see Switzerland, that I represent as a colonial country at this point, because there's uh, recently a lot of studies about how um, colonial countries are not necessarily countries that have formal colonies. And in the, in the current context, that's what we're doing. So. The flip, the flip side of the question, of course, with this bleak picture, should we stop doing it? And of course, when you stop doing it, then there's no money for the project that we support, which very often we, we believe in. Um, so the way to go about that for me is very uh, clearly in the sort of um, clarity one can create about one's intentions. I think there is um, something to say, probably there's a need for the specific foundations that have the an agenda in um, uh, all kinds of issues that are related to society that uh, want people to create work that supports this kind of direction. There are other foundations like ours and that a lot of people here present that we really look very clearly at the development, the professional development of the independent art sector as such and want to do that from the point of view of the um, professional artists and, and their sort of professional environment. And there, um, the, the most important thing is to have smart people at the, at the head of that who can um, take the opportunity to consult very wide, widely about what really the immediate urgencies are in, in the artistic context. Um, I think our concerns with the sort of burning world at this point are not only the funded concerns, very much the artist concerns, and uh, something that will definitely come up from that side as, as well. So for these organizations, it's very, very important to, to consult very widely. Having said that, again, if you talk to 100 different people, you get 100 different opinions about that. So there, it also is, uh, in the end, somewhere, depending on your capacity of analysis, on your experience, uh, on your good user experience, to be able to, um, to translate that into uh, effective policies that can make a difference in the artistic group. Um, 
So basically, that's a little bit in the direction where we are like, going to. Maybe another point that was important there, which I continue to believe very strongly, which I want to add as a last point, that uh, in a lot of these funding mechanisms that go from people that are working in a context where there is a lot of money uh, and lots of good conditions to work in the arts and culture sector towards contexts where those positions aren't available, um, it's extremely important for us to always make the kind of hypothetical exercise of what we require from our grantees is that something we would require from our own artists. And if that's not the case, I think we're doing something wrong. Um, in, in a very simple way, if you would want an African artist to make something about their impoverished context or about that is something that is culturally uh, clearly African, uh, don't do that because you would not ask from a uh, Spanish artist to make something Spanish or to make something about their very comfortable context. Um, so it's not, it's not it, that is actually perpetuating this kind of colonial uh, relationship you, you have there. That's a simplistic example, but I think these kind of requirements and pressures are, um, can become very complex and so complex that a lot of us will apply them in moments that we are not even aware that we're applying them. Thank you, Amar. In your very good model that you gave us, um, I was suggesting that uh, democratic countries uh, can give funding with objective, transparent criteria. Jasper just said that um, it has to do with power relation, there is always an agenda, and it very much depends on the person, the personality who's in the post, and the sensitivities that they have. Can you comment on how that relates to objective and transparent criteria? Is that a dream, or does that really exist? Okay. I don't know. I think that what I've presented here. ما قدمته هنا ليس تقديم حصري يعني كل التجارب الموجودة لا تدخل بالضرورة في إطار واحد من الأمثلة التي قدمتها لأنه هناك طبعا بعض التجارب الناجحة يمكن أن أعطي مثال مثال الصندوق the example uh, of the international fund for uh, diversity, for cultural diversity of the UNESCO that was incepted uh, in a transparent way based on transparent standards. Uh, that's why I do believe that we can have initiatives where arbitration uh, is acceptable where the artist can express freely Thank you Rana, you called yourself in one of our emails an intermediary and you also questioned or, or asked some questions about what Jasper was referring to as these power uh, relationships, and you were wondering about independence and funding. And I remember very well in the years when the AFAC, the Arab Fund for Arts and Culture, was just a dream, there was a lot of discussion about the fact that not all the funds should be coming from Western uh, sources, and why couldn't there be some Arab sources uh, for this? Now you are kind of the intimate intermediary, um, being able to play a role in those power relationships. Can you talk about that? Uh, thank you very much, Maria. In fact, I will try to answer your question through maybe um, three points. Uh, <coughs> switching to Arabic. Um, I have a 
We most important that question, uh, and that from the first day we have this question without having a session concerning the funding was is that the funding having an influence on the values and the freedom of expression and the freedom of choosing a subject, the freedom of the experience, freedom of the innovation, and as well the freedom of the cultural institution in building cultural systems and cultural projects. So here I'm not only talking about the freedom of the artist as an individual, but as a whole dynamic. And here I am talking about a personal point of view, and we are all trying to be, we all be pro. Uh, and we might all be uh, here provocative because we are in front of a problematic. The answer is clear the relationship between any funder and the recipient of the fund is a forced relationship, but I hope it, it's always a relationship where we have a certain balance between both, where we have negotiation, where we can find uh, or where we can strike a balance between the powers. And what I mean here, I'm talking first of all about a, a region where we have no public funding except in some uh, countries where governments dedicate a certain amount of, uh, of money uh, to the cultural project, but uh, in general we don't have that kind of project unless the event has a lot of PR, so, and we have exceptions of course, but in general there is no awareness concerning that subject and individual uh, contributions where many individuals are interested, they are contributing, they are supporting, but it's always a limited resource. So this, I'm talking based on that, how in that region, in that orient, where we are trying hopelessly to find uh, forces in terms of financing, can we continue? When I deal with funders, I deal with them as partners and as people that need me as I need them. I need their funds, but there are institutions as well having objectives, uh, results that need to be uh, achieved. So, in the, at the end of the day, we are parties that will help them achieve their goals as they are helping us achieve our goals. So. I always hope that we as Arab artists can build on that and can have a word to say in that relationship. The negotiation spaces are related to our capacity to have a clear agenda. I have once said during the first day that any donor will have uh, his agenda. But it's not something bad because we do have our agenda as individuals and institutions. We have our concerns, we have our agendas. So fixing an agenda against an agenda is a strength. It becomes a weakness when the funding is related to the agendas of the donors rather than people seeking funds. And the third aspect is to try to find more common ground with partners and donors. And the common grounds can be achieved not only when the agendas are interlinked, but through accumulation. And that will lead to long-term relationships where the issue of funding won't be that problematic. Long-term relationships means transforming the relationship from being a relationship related to an economic aspect to a certain positivity, to a certain coalition. 
So when the donor and the, the Arab institution or the institution working in Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, or anywhere else can, can be able to build a coalition with the donors serving its objective. So by this, we change as well the dynamic of the relationship that is bothering us all. Second, concerning this system for the region, as Marianne mentioned, one of the main important things that I've mentioned when we were preparing through the emails uh, was a question, do we have mediators as, uh, such as us, we mediators, we cultural mediators, do we, can we as uh, Arab institution be mediators between artists and donors and is this role important or necessary? I'm not completely sure about my answer. What do we mean by mediators? We have strategies, annual plans, the donors have strategies and annual plans, and some donors are interested in supporting the artists of the region for different reasons. So how this work is done, most of the important donors cannot know the details of the region and the artists of the region, as well as their experiences even if they are uh, aware of the general situation of the region. Because generally, these donors don't have uh, persons in the field to uh, know more how to disperse uh, sponsorship for individuals. So do we have institutions that can play this role in a very positive way and be able to influence the politics of donors and not only cooperate with them? Do we have a role to play? I will give an example. Al Mourad today is a part of the steering committee preparing for the uh, meet, meeting of uh, donors, of uh, artistic donors uh, in the Arab region that encompasses a big, uh, many stakeholders supporting uh, art in the region. So during these meetings, uh, I've asked, and one of them was held in Beirut, I've asked what is the role expected of cultural institutions in the Arab world to work hand in hand with the donors in terms of uh, sponsorship of policies and the policies in general. I do believe that uh, a gathering for all the donors can be a good uh, platform and uh, we should publish what they are deciding and uh, try through this platform or other meetings such as our meeting today to talk about what is expected from the cultural institutions in order to have an influence on the donors' politics and not only open the channels of, uh, of funds for the region. The third point, I don't know. Uh, so I don't know if that point was clear, but I will move to the third point. We can take a lot of ethical decisions concerning refusing funds. And yeah, sometimes I do agree that we need to reject fundings from certain parties, but because we have to make sure that we are always independent, having our word to say concerning our political, economic, uh, social ideas, and based on that we can accept the funding, yes or no. But uh, at the end of the day, if you want to talk about sustainability, I know that many people uh, here have uh, questions concerning uh, the ethical aspect of the funding. I'm with that uh, dialogue if we propose alternatives and if we suggest alternatives. We've been talking a lot about these alternatives, but we need to build on the experiences of the world 
and uh, try to talk about many uh, projects, uh, many uh, projects that can help our uh, our artwork. We have to think about the alternatives because till now in the Arab region we still lack uh, funding. So how we can revive the local uh, funding because as Marianne mentioned when the fund when the Arab fund was accepted it was to have funding for the region and to have a fund where all the uh, capital of investors funding of investors can uh, be uh, harnessed for in order to help the uh, art uh, work but till now the fund didn't achieve its objective, though uh, having a lot of improvement and development. So till now the objectives are not met. What are the alternatives? This is a very important question. Instead of, ask, of asking ourselves, shall we accept the funding, yes or no? Shall we think about uh, the international funding in a different way? Uh, shall the uh, Gulf country think that at the end of uh, the day the uh, oil resources will be depleted? Uh, so we can talk about that and I believe that many uh, entities in the uh, innovation production industry are talking about that or discussing that in order to diversify the funding sources and I do believe that the other parties, the other stakeholders will need to, take that, to talk about that in depth in order to find the alternatives. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, does everybody know that what she was talking about when she said the, the meeting of the in the Arab world? How many people don't know? Could you explain a little bit? Why didn't they expect it? is very important and it's a subject that we are discussing now in Palestine. Uh, donors won't know the exact context, the exact local context. My question to uh, Rana concern uh, the independence of uh, donors in two terms. With this mediation, we will be putting or creating some standards, artistic standards, concerning what is convenient, yes or no, what is contemporary art and what is not. And here we will be having some monopoly. And that's what we are facing uh, uh, currently in uh, Palestine with some institutions. So how can we overcome this problem and maintain this status? 
that can currently be a solution for many problems. My uh, second question concerns the democratization. I will give you an example. In Palestine now we have many important uh, donors that are entering in coalition uh, with local uh, donors. We have many important uh, uh, local donors or two main institutions. Uh, so the money uh, was going to independent institutions, but now the money is uh, transferred in the framework of this coalition, this big coalition, so the small institutions are not being taken into consideration. So the uh, a big donor was uh, giving uh, funds to many uh, small institutions, but now through this big coalition, uh, funding is only going to big institutions. The second question, when doing this coalition, the donors are not asking the uh, point of view of the society or the pr about the, pr uh, the priorities of the society. Now we don't have a strategic work and we don't know what is the opinion of the independent sector. So how can we overcome all these issues? Because in Palestine we have bad fires, there are bad fires instead of being uh, a, a a solution for the problem. I think um, Alma and then Iman and then it's related, yeah? Um, and I think you know, one point of this uh, is, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the question of relationship because uh, uh, treating the relationship, the personal relation as uh, donor beneficiary is very uh, controversial when it comes to the uh, core exchange, artistic exchange and cultural exchange between <coughs> the country and uh, two countries, for example, or regions, of course, and that's one thing. And the other is uh, even more uh, risky, is about uh, those uh, institutions becoming a cartel. And, it's, uh, and we, we see the relationship is becoming very competitive. It's the Coca-Cola versus the Pepsi-Cola. And, uh, and I agree with you, Rana, and thank you for highlighting uh, the issue that I think another report will ensure transparency will uh, answer the many accusations that are happening in the Kurwa about uh, corruption, about uh, uh, um, allies uh, you know, coming together in forms of recourse that serve certain institutions. And you know exactly that I'm not hallucinating. And those uh, things are happening in our region. But I mean, there's an added value that this uh, alliance as such can respond uh, in a, in a, on an emergency basis very quickly. But it's the same concept of uh, having one dictator or having <laughs> multiple parties to speak with. So uh, the issue of democratization is very critical and it's very, it's very dangerous to, uh, to, to fall into the trap of uh, brokering. Um, it's really going into, into um, an area where commercializing art, I would say, rather than, uh, than funding, or rather than keeping that uh, core intellectual human value of the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Let me start for a minute with the speakers. The effect is on the Quran, the Holy Quran, the Ashida, and the fact that we should really have the Buddha Qawafdin. I mean, we're not. في كمان ممولين متضامنين يعني هذول كمان ما ننسى في تمويل في العلاقة بالتضامن and uh, some donors uh, are presenting uh, funds in solidarity with some uh, issues and some, uh, uh, and some uh, subjects. So we can't uh, generalize and we have to think how the institutions will uh, uh, respond to the funding. Concerning the mediation, we've tried it, but after a certain period of time, mediation will become a burden. And even a part of the funding will go to maintain this mediation in the structure. So how can we overcome this and build confidence 
because sometimes in lack of confidence we will have to pay much more uh, much more money I will try to comment uh, first but I think that here I've set myself a trap Solidarity is an agenda here. I'm not uh, saying that uh, all agendas are uh, negative. They have donors have agenda, even uh, if they are agendas of solidarities. So they are good agendas. Concerning mediation, I'm not uh, only talking about fiscal mediation. I'm talking about cultural mediation as well. And since the first uh, session on ITM, we've talked about the mediation, the mediation that an artist or an art institution will have to do in the society. And here I'm talking about uh, the same principle. I'm talking about uh, politics and about uh, uh, economic orientation. Some institution can play a role in being a mediator and in uh, attracting additional funds uh, for donors to take care of the uh, of the region, have interest for the region, and uh, that if their project and if their if their projects are as well in the interest of the art in the region. So, uh, fi uh, fiscal mediation is there. And if you want to see the first question of Fatin. If you want to make sure that this institution won't have a monopoly on the orientation of, uh, the, of the artwork in our region, we have to make sure that they are accountable. And mediation don't have to be uh, make putting an end to the relationship or uh, impeding the relationship between the two parties because a good uh, cultural relationship means opening the floor opening the door to transparency and this mediation will be the translation of needs and orientations as well trends in the cultural uh, field in the arab world but through confidence and a certain level of confidence so this institution or this donor will move things further forward so we have two types of mediation so the most important thing is first of all the diversity of the donors the problem is that uh, in the region we just have like 10 institutions able to provide uh, funds, not more than that. So for any program we need to diversify the donors. If we only have one donor, we will have to abide by its condition. But if we have like five donors, that will be easier for us to have a certain freedom and we have as well to make sure that none of these institutions will have an influence on the cultural trends of the artwork in the region. We have to empower our institutions, our artists in order to guarantee this freedom of expression. I'd love to just end on that. It's such a positive message. But what we're talking about uh, is um, the tendency for centralizing these funds. So once again, the foundations are some, some of the foundations are giving their funds to another foundation to treat. So there are less possibilities for the, the people in the region uh, to to apply for funds. I, I give an example of uh, of. Uh, Soros Foundation, the Hibos Foundation, are sometimes giving all of their funds for a certain region or country to the other one to do it. So instead of having two doors to knock on, you only have one. We're also talking about gatekeepers. So who is the gatekeeper? Uh, why do we pay for the gatekeeper <laughs> when perhaps we feel we don't need that gatekeeper? I think the same thing could be said in terms of 
uh, curators and programmers, uh, because we're talking here a lot about uh, programs and projects, whereas from an individual artistic point of view, they might feel the same about gatekeepers who are gatekeeping artistically. But what we're also talking about here is whoever is in the position of being on the other level, are they listening? Are they listening to the intermediary? Who's listening to the artist? And perhaps the audience too, I'm not sure. And are they flexible enough? Because let's face it, none of the people here are the ultimate people who sign the checks. None of the people here are the ultimate people who are responsible for the entire policy of the entire institution. We do not have the director generals, we don't have the, you know, these are people who also have to argue for what they believe in from what they've been hearing from the field. And I'm going to ask Pascal, her name, who uh, probably has one of the most difficult jobs of making the donor listen because you are working with the European Commission. We try. <laughs> I don't know if we could walk to be the European Commission. We talk a lot about agenda, and uh, I work towards everything. And we are talking about agenda, and I think it's a kind of articulation between the political project and the context. And it's maybe quite interesting to go back to the political project and to the context. Um, the context is quite difficult to, to define the context. I remember we, we use a lot of post, post colonial, post uh, national, post things to define the context. But we know two or three things about this context. We know that it will change very quickly. Definitely. And uh, a lot of politics. We know this. It's not so optimistic, but uh, it's the reality of this context. And in this area, we know that. Uh, two, three, five years, we will have a lot of reorganization, a lot of recomposition uh, in the different countries, in the regions, through economy, through mobilities of persons, through a lot of others. So it's quite important to have this context because in front of we have the political project and the articulation between the content of the political project to define an agenda. And if you look at the political project at the moment, when we are talking about the European Union, it's difficult to say if we have a political project or if we have different political projects and if we have to choose between these different political projects. Uh, so we know that the UK has decided to leave, so we will see in two years uh, what will happen, but we are sure that this point will reorganize the political project. The UK has to find its own external policy, has to redefine what it wants to do in this area through culture and through different policy. But at the moment, in Brussels, we talk a lot about culture and external policy. And the Brexit uh, give a, quite a big impulsion to this uh, new, I don't know, agenda, a new point of the and we know that we have a two or three interesting or dangerous points in this uh, recomposition. I'm not sure that we could be confident or we could be afraid of the future. We have to look at the situation and we, everything could be dangerous or quite interesting. One of the points is something about the actual digitalization in Europe, you know. And uh, when we are talking about culture and this kind of policy, it's, uh, the first point is how we, we will uh, articulate this uh, issue of security and this issue of culture. So we have to redefine what is the, the intercultural relationship. We know that we have something about religions in this point, in this area. And what could happen? The first thing that could happen is uh, more money. It's quite interesting, but more money. I'm quite sure in two or three years we will have a lot of money for culture in this area. But culture with this uh, difficulty to define it through this necessity to 
redefined interpretability, we would like to create a more balanced situation, something like an horizontal dialogue, something where we could define a common approach of a common situation, or if we want to say which kind of development, which kind of choices the source has to do, and certainly, uh, you know, or European and French, European is quite arrogant, so we could be quite afraid that this redefinition of the interculturality uh, has to become something like uh, an imposition of a model. So we have to look at the situation, but at the same time, to really to look at the situation as a, for the opportunity and for the danger, and really to look at the opportunity. The second point I want to underline is the necessity to talk about independence. We know that um, this external policy and uh, this uh, policy, European policy, it's impossible to imagine that it's, it's, to, to, to develop this policy, we know that we need independent actors not national actors. A lot of diplomacy imagine that they have to, to be ready to take the money. I work in France at the moment, so you can imagine so the British Council will leave, so we will have a lot of funds, new funds, and we could use these funds to uh, imagine new cultural activities. But we know that the cultural diplomacy certainly has something to do, but we need to have a strong civil society in able to imagine the new way of action uh, regarding this uh, new context. So which kind of things we could imagine for independence? The first thing is really to talk about independence because we, we don't have the same definition. When we are talking about independence in the north of Europe is something regarding possibility of receiving some subsidies, to people subsidies to develop their own works. But when you talk about independence in Turkey, for example, we have a complete other definition, but not at all something about public money, it's something about possibility to develop in your own, your, your own, your, 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 your work. So, independence is uh, important because if we don't take this point for this seriously, we will have a lot of other debates, uh, like entrepreneurship. We, uh, one of the points, we imagine that entrepreneurship would be the solution for everything, for us also. But it's different to imagine a, 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 a work of civil society uh, with strong independent actors and a civil society composed by entrepreneurs. That's uh, two, two main jobs, and we have also to face uh, this the last point I would like to underline is where we could recompose this civil society. And if we look at the network at the moment, we, we, could be, we, we could be sure that we need to find a new step in the development of the network. And a new step in the development more connected with the context and more connected with the the difficulty and the point in the, on the line of the tensions in this context. So we have to face uh, something about security. We never talk in the, in the network, in the cultural network about security. We have to talk the intercultural dialogue strongly and not as a kind of uh, European or UNESCO things. Uh, we are really to, to, to talk about what is behind this and what we could create. And we have also to imagine network able to develop and to support new communities of work, new communities of uh, little groups, of independent actors able to produce this different this situation or with this different project units, something in this way. Talking with the European Commission about this, impossible, <laughs> difficult. Not impossible, not difficult. But we, if we talk with uh, the European Commission, not through culture or not through funds, but through politics and through uh, the, in the, the 
political debate, I think we could open this one door. One is open as will open last uh, last July for the for and uh, then this is Morgan is a high representative of uh, external policy. And she has opened the doors uh, to the cultural actors and asked the cultural actors if we could do something in this situation. At the moment we don't uh, have plates uh, with the thought and imagine this kind of answer, but at the moment some politicians opened space or open subject on the good act way change with us about what we could do, but we are not really already. So I think it's quite important this kind of meeting because uh, certainly we have to face very practical things, but at the same time we have also uh, to face the necessity to have a, a strong political approach in order to talk this kind of uh, multilateral donors or funders. And the point of the point I think for the network is we need to choose where we want to to be in this public broken position in this political position of this arena. Hello. Thank you, Pascal. If I if I heard you well, um, you're talking about a number of different things, but you're also talking about the the kind of. We just need. I'm sorry to interrupt. We need the one minute because the translators has to leave, and we are taking their place. So we're switching. Okay. Can the translators are doing such an amazing job here. I can tell you. Because we have 
quite difficult to redefine the food project. There are a lot of I'm sure if you talk about refugees, we <laughs> we could be, we could, could agree, but I think we couldn't. And then about the answer, about the kind of thing we could do, as you could say, we, we, we have so so much uh, refugees born things uh, uh, during the last the last years in, in Europe. But really, we have to take part of the debate and to see which kind of things we could propose and which kind of analysis of the situation we have. And this kind of area is completely necessary in this uh, moment of a very strong work position. Everything is open. And uh, we know that in the two or three years we will have stronger work positions than we have uh, what we had before. And we have to be in this, uh, in this delay. It's difficult because we have at the same time our own project, our own agenda, um, our own problem about money and uh, everything. But if we don't go in this debate, I think we will run out of money or we will run out of the politicians if they want to have a, a policy for culture. And really we have to be an actor of the civil debate. Something like the citizens and the cultural actors in the work of position of citizenship. I'm also reminded of a, of a city a cultural uh, politician in the city of Turin in Italy who changed from culture to, I think the, her department was called social inclusion. And she said, you know, uh, when uh, the cultural people come to me, they say, we want this much money. And when the social people come to me, they say, we have this dream. She said, who do you think I like to listen to? <laughs> So, um, I will turn to the poor person who has to defend Brexit. <laughs> you, you don't have to. But I'll also uh, just mention a little anecdote which English people or British people will know very well. For years and years, I've worked for the Arts Council in England for about five years, a long time ago. And there was a, a, a joke which is so boring that we all have heard it so many times and this has to do with the gatekeepers, is that actually what should happen is there should just be one little window and one person sitting there with a checkbook. You know, we don't need all these extra people and experts and all the rest of it. So, Stephen, from your position as a British Council, and you have been promoted and promoted, so you're not the person with the, the little window and the checkbook, and the, but you're really not an intermediary in between being able to speak to that top level and people being able to understand the people who are working on the ground, face to face, the artists, working with the audiences. Are you a friend or a foe? <laughs> well, first of all, I see I'm First of all, I have to say it's a joy to come to. I spent five years working in the East and to come to a meeting. And the most contentious thing I have to deal with is um, uh, UK's relationship with Europe and not the Balfour Declaration or lines drawn on the map is in a way a joy. Um, yeah, Brexit, <laughs> Brexit is, um, is, is a disaster, I think, and a disaster in many ways. But one of the sadder things about it is I don't think it changes the way the UK looks at its external policy at all, or even for that matter, the British Council looks at its external policy. Because sadly, it didn't really see itself as doing those things with Europe in the first place. So, um, which I say is a sadness, as far as I'm concerned, a complete sadness, but the truth. And I think one of the few joys that may come out of Brexit is that organisations like ours now have to take Europe seriously have to look at a new relationship with Europe, which it's never done before. However, um, I'd better get on, I'm aware I'm the last person, it's, the translators have already gone, and probably all of you wish you had gone as well, but, um, so, actually I'll keep it very quick, because I wrote, that's all the notes I've written, and I've forgotten my glasses, so I can't see them anymore. Anyway. <laughs> so, um, and the most worrying thing Jasper said, for me, in his description of, of uh, the role of uh, kind of international art in the region was that the important thing was to have someone smart at the top because 
um, I moved back to the UK to be on the top of a certain fund that's being created, and I'm in no way smart. I didn't go to university, and the only thing I was ever trained to do was be an actor. So this is probably very worrying for everybody who's about to apply for that fund. But um, what I'll do is just, I say that partly because also I'm not going to go into the theory of funding. Um, because I don't have the background and I probably don't have the understanding either. I'm just going to uh, make four very practical observations from my relationship with funding and then some reflections afterwards. My simple answer to the question of is funding friend or foe would be that it is automatically neither and can be either. Um, you know, broadly, um, funding obviously covers, funding programs covers an awful lot as a mere sort of detail um, and a lot of complexity. But broadly, there's, there's people with money who want to put, who want to do something. That thing has parameters, has an agenda, as Marla said. And then if that fits with the artist's agenda, that can be a threat. If it doesn't fit very well, it's a balance of frustrations. If it's bad, then it can be destructive. Um, so the four, the four observations I would make, and I'm, I'm aware I'm here as a funder, I'm not backing that. I, I, I need more to suit to demonstrate it. But the first couple are from, as an artist, and I would observe when I felt uh, fierce was, was just before I really was aware of the idea of my relationship and funding. So as a, as a young actor, um, I, uh, I was able to live with not much money and, um, and had a lot of time. And in that sense, that can feel free because I didn't have much money. And then I had the first sort of element of fortune in my career, which was to adapt a play by a, a famous Italian writer, Dario Fo. It was published, it was quite celebrated. Therefore, I got commissions. I had friends around me who were struggling as writers, I didn't have to struggle. Suddenly, somebody was giving me a check to do what I do. Um, if you like, that was with commerce. Uh, what, I, uh, what I would notice about that is, in one sense, it's very free. Nobody was telling you what hours I should work, how I should do it, or whatever, and I got the money up front, largely. Um, but it was probably the most restrictive thing I ever did ask, because you're aware of the commercial restraints around it, including how many people you write for. Um, it has to go to the West End, so it has to be this kind of play. Um, it has to be delivered in this way. Um, that was my first with the sort of commercial groups of funding. Um, for one reason or another, I moved to a theatre in Scotland as a director, and we were incredibly fortunate, very fortunate, small, small city of only 150,000 people. We had a total, we had a, a, we were the most, the best funded theatre in Scotland. I note, however, that funding came from various things we did, so from uh, from social work sources uh, for our work in community development, from education for our work with excluded uh, young people, the young people who weren't working through the education system, um, through the health service, through mental health. Well, actually, five percent, roughly five percent of our funding was to make work, was to make kids. The rest of it was either for the building itself, for the staff. Or for one of those functions. But nevertheless, that was a huge resource. Great frustration, and one of the frustrations was when our funders sought to do things, promote new writers, let's say, why not just give us the money? Why set up a big scheme that, that you have to apply for, etc., etc.? Um, that was a frustration at the time. Move on to my third is when I came to Cairo to be director of arts for Middle East North Africa for British Council. And the first question people tend to ask you um, when you're at meetings like this, like this is, is what is the agenda, what's the hidden agenda? I always used to answer it in the same, same way as well, there is a very clear agenda, it's not very well, well hidden, because it's, uh, it's in the name, British Council, um, and that, uh, you know, obviously, what you're looking to do is make direct connections, as I say, sadly, with particularly one country. And what I observe about the funding is obviously people were coming to you in a very different way. 
they were looking for, as the question suggests, support for the artistic landscape. And that is a that is a difficult interaction because I think it could be a useful thing to have that variety of funding, as Ron was suggesting, if the base of public funding is there. If it's not, then you're completely pulled by those agendas. To, to give a little fairly benign example, I guess in the British County cases, you were seeing artists all the time that didn't really need to be connecting with the UK, they would do their project much better without a British artist or without the need to go backwards and forwards to Britain. But that's what came with our country. Yeah. So, as I said, my fourth is now. Now, so what I'm doing back in the UK, or one part of what I'm doing back in the UK, is um, a fund with, with the UK government wanting to have a cultural protection fund. And so for the first time, I'm sort of looking at uh, how it works for political funds. Um, and what I notice is that my interest has suddenly become about putting a set of parameters, a set of parameters that restrict the people who are about to apply to it. Why? Well, because what has happened already is otherwise you get patronage um, that um, strictly between us, of course, but they won't go out of the room. But the, the previous Chancellor of the Exchequer happened to be a good friend of the guy who runs the British Museum. They went to school together. So when they first thought of doing this, the money went directly that way. So uh, to stop that, you obviously say, well, we'll do this, do this, do this, do this. That means saying, right, well, there's a certain amount of countries you will work with. So why why not Mali, why Sudan? It's in the end you put a box around it. Um, and uh, you do that, I suppose, for the sake of transparency in some way. I happen to think that you can take things like systems, transparency and all those things far too far. Because if you take it too far, you lose humanity and you stop looking at, for example, is that a good project? Is that just, just, does that feel like a good project? There's no way of doing that within amounts of boxes. Um, so that, that, that should really mean my own reflections on all that would be, I think that however you, however you look at where the money's coming from, if we're thinking of the money as what is broadly given in kind of taxes in the organisation society, whether we're going to tax or whether we're looking at things like the huge amounts spent by our country, by the EU, on things like development, then in, in all that sphere, I think it's personally, I think it's vitally important that arts and culture has a share of that. And I think, therefore, it's slightly dangerous to look at um, because in any one situation there are dangers attached to it, to walk away from um, that, that whole sphere of fun. I think also it's equally important to be cautious about other forms of funding as any kind of elite, whether that's patronage through uh, corporations and, and businesses or patronage to individuals. All of these things have a certain degree uh, of danger attached to them. Um, and finally, I suppose I would say that all sounds like it's suggesting that the kind of European model of a sort of mixed funding is the answer and important. I would say it isn't. Um, I think it's. I think the answer is, is, is you know, something more about kind of tailoring the balance of those things to the culture you're working in. I think the um, UK is a great example of what can go wrong. At the moment, I think there is a funding crisis through being far too. We, we are basically funding um, institutions, we're funding um, buildings rather than work. And we tend to be judging what we're doing on efficiency, on um, uh, 
uh, are you are you employing good practice rather than are good things coming in? Um, Thank you. So we've come full circle in a way, Amar, to your scheme that we can have democratic uh, societies or economies and still have what I used to call the director's back pockets. You know, I went to school with her. Here's some money. Um, we can also have criteria that can be transparent but without humanity. So we've actually come to a brilliant position of having no conclusion whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> and we haven't even talked about crowdfunding, and we haven't talked about too much about sustainability, and we haven't even approached what was coming to our mind at the time. You know, they said that, that, that uh, populations get the politicians they deserve. Uh, does do the, the formats of our funding reflect the signs of the times and somehow reflect our own desires, bad habits, patterns of thinking? I would like to ask one of the interpreters there how much more time we have. It's not okay, so we could be here until 10. <laughs> um, I'm sure you'd love that. But I would really like to take at least, let's say, five questions. Oh, comments or questions. I saw you first, and then number two, and then... I uh, uh, Okay, so there's the first key. In dialogue with the funding bodies. I'm going to talk about the Lebanese example because this is where I live and work. What, what do we do when there are no uh, precise priorities, when there are no uh, researches or uh, work on the ground that actually directs the funding towards the right places? Uh, especially outside the capital when, uh, it, with decentralization, because there's not enough researches, there's not enough work uh, that emphasizes priorities that can influence funders. And uh, these few uh, organizations that you are representing, uh, have you taken this uh, uh, consideration uh, as a priority to encourage research, researchers and encourage uh, mapping or existing uh, forms or priorities? Uh, and another idea I'd like to uh, talk about is that this uh, discussion has uh, somehow limited, was limited to uh, funding uh, uh, bodies. But uh, to, in my opinion, funding covers more than just uh, funding bodies. It also um, covers uh, community and crowdfunding. It also uh, includes the pressure that can be uh, how how governments can be pressured to contribute to funding culture, and not only ministries of culture, but also economy ministry of, of the economy, uh, some taxes systems or the lottery uh, systems, and this is where our role comes to the surface. And that's where we're not taking our responsibility fully, is that we're not in coalitions that are strong enough to exercise this pressure. Our lack of organization is somehow a factor that threatens the liberty of uh, cultural practice. And uh, from Lebanon, this also applies uh, internationally. Comments, not questions, because we want to have time to answer them. Thank you. But really good points. Uh, unfortunately, I had a question. 
I wouldn't ask it anyway. Because uh, but it's not at the same time the reaction um, concerning Europe, I come back to that. Um, first question is, uh, I would have like to have some ideas about this, how the European Union sees the um, external relation, the, the future of external relation, and how uh, we Europeans could build in that frame a meaningful uh, bridge to the region here, for example, for, for the future, in, and in the future project. And then my second, the second part of this question and uh, reaction is, um, um, I'm reacting because uh, you were saying that we cultural actors should be part of the European debate and uh, should uh, um, uh, yeah, be political actors. And I heard you saying that for a long time now and you repeated it. And in a way we tried, I mean we cultural actors of Europe tried that. Uh, we uh, did this uh, alliance for culture that uh, with uh, ITN is also part of, and I, for me, this is more about we have a dream than we want money. And it's also difficult to, uh, but now we have a problem is that um, we don't really know how to go further and uh, how to um, uh, do the lobbying work that should be done. And should lobbying work be done, or is there really space for a political debate on the European project? At this point, I have the impression that there is no political project at all in Europe, or that there are a lot of different political projects, but there's no political dream anymore. So, um, uh, if, so, yeah, so that's what my point is just. Um, how can we go further than this repeating, we should be actors? Can, I, can I just remind you that we're not talking only about Europe, we're yes, talking yes. about the countries of the Middle East and North Africa. Yeah, and just as a, as a small point, That's why having agree. left my very close and long time relationship with the European Commission's cultural movement, <coughs> it is far more easier. That's not correct English, it's far easier. <laughs> To speak to the youth parts of the Commission, to speak to the education parts of the Commission, it's easier, you have a better dialogue with the development uh, parts of the European Commission. And so when we're speaking about Europe in this panel, we're talking about the way that Europe is relating to the Middle East and North Africa. Just, yeah, to, just to correct. Yeah. yeah. And the third hand, somebody before, who was the third person? Yeah, I just have an observation. I'm speaking from the perspective of uh, just an artist and um, director of a very small organization with some international experience. So I think in the past maybe 10 years, um, uh, performing artists, and not that I'm talking specifically about performing artists, um, in uh, at least the Arab Levant have, I think, pursued like three strategies outside of the traditional festival commissioning uh, economy. Uh, the first is um, to be subsumed by the contemporary art circuit um, to adapt their work so that it's um, commodity for biennials, basically, in galleries. The second is to succumb to like, the use of digital technologies and multimedias um, and to make that the center of the work. And then the third course is to subscribe to like the humanitarian agenda, um, uh, which uh, we're all familiar with that. Uh, I'm wondering, and I guess maybe then you're probably main person who can address this question. Um, but among the funding, like the, the main funding bodies in the region, I'm wondering how, how, how seriously they're approaching um, particular private sector companies and thinking about um, the strategies approaching those um, sectors through visit uh, funding so in other words, um, are these uh, organizations, these peer organizations, are they, for instance, approaching the giant engineering firms, for instance? to begin to think about, okay, um, can we develop a funding initiative that somehow integrates the ideas of engineering and disseminates these ideas, right? And maybe we make some sacrifices on, on the level of content, kind of cares. But at the end of the day, we're going to be diversifying the funding. Are, are we uh, approaching institutions who are interested in medical, um, uh, and what, what funding from, from medicine, for instance? 
uh, dental industry. I don't know, I mean, I'm just uh, thinking out loud, or the hospitality industry, even. Um, what is that relationship like? Okay, I said five questions, and I had three hands that went up. Bahid, I know you well enough, and you know me well enough. I'm going to cut it there, because I think, I'm really going to cut it there, because I think that everybody is exhausted, there are lots of people leaving, and we can't abuse the people who come in to help us either. So, normally when we get out and wait for the bus, or we get into the bar, or whatever the equivalent of the bar is, we talk about other things. Can I ask you to keep continuing this conversation when you get out the door? Thank you so much, everybody.